lifted up his eyes and saw behind his back a ram amongst the briars, sticking fast by the horns, which he took and offered for a holocaust instead of his son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear friends, one of the most difficult commands given by God was given to Abraham, the holy patriarch. God said to him, Take thine only begotten son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and go into the land of vision. And there thou shalt offer him for a holocaust upon the mountains, which I will show thee. Isaac was conceived by a miracle to the once barren Sarah. Nature has planted, implanted in the hearts of parents a strong affection for their children. Their helpless condition, their many wants and needs of childhood render this affection necessary. And parental affection is intensified when it is concentrated in an only child. The natural strong love and affection Abraham had for his son was enhanced by Isaac's piety, Isaac's virtue, which ennobles and strengthens that affection for each other a hundredfold. Parental affection comes from God himself. We read in sacred scripture, from whom all paternity in heaven on earth is derived. The more the supernatural love increases towards God, the more the parental affection is intensified towards the child. Abraham was a most devout servant of God. And thus we can begin to understand how he loved Isaac so much, and how Isaac loved him. Isaac was a noble son. He was handsome. He was the fruit of divine promise. He was to be a father of a nation as numerous as the stars of the firmament, the sands of the sea. And from his side, kings were to spring up. What endeared him to his parents, to his mother and father, even more so, was the respect and the reverence he had for his parents. Young in age, Isaac was already endowed with many virtues. This is the child Abraham is to sacrifice with his own hands. And then to burn the body, to totally consume Isaac with the fire of Holocaust. This is what the pagans wanted of their devotees, if I can use that term. This task from God was to make manifest the holiness of the father, Abraham, and of the son, Isaac. Abraham, as you might well suspect, was tormented interiorly for three days. As he began his journey to the Mount of Visions with his innocent son, and each day that pain increased more and more, as did his love for his son increase each day more and more. As Abraham arrived at the foot of the mountain of sacrifice, he took his boy, perhaps 12, perhaps 14 years of age, and he began to load on his shoulders the wood for sacrifice. As they were ascending the mountain, Isaac looks at his dad, who was carrying fire in one hand and had his dagger sheathed around his waist. He said, my father, behold, we have the fire, we have the wood, but where is the victim for the sacrifice? You can only imagine, or maybe we can't imagine, the emotions that flooded the mind and the heart of Isaac. Yet with discipline and courage, Abraham responded, God will provide himself a victim for the Holocaust, my son. Abraham was prophesying more than he knew. For he believed that God had provided him, and it was his own son. 
Did any Old Testament figure ever suffer as did Abraham with this command? Some of you have lost your children in childbirth or before childbirth or maybe even after childbirth. Maybe some accident, maybe a car accident or something. But God is asking Abraham to sacrifice his own son. Arriving at the place of sacrifice, Abraham and Isaac began to make the altar. As the boys know well here, in building a fire, you start with the real tiny sticks, kindling. And then you put the bigger sticks, and then you put the small logs, and you put the bigger logs. And so that's how they made the altar in layers. The bigger laws, the altar was about three feet deep, about seven feet wide, and enough wood to totally consume the sacrifice. The altar finished. Abraham embraces Isaac. He kisses him on the head. Had he ever kissed him with such love as he did that day? Isaac looks up at his eyes. They're all full of tears. And Isaac knows immediately that's the answer that I asked. Where is the sacrifice? He knew that he was the sacrifice at that moment. Abraham could hardly glance at his son's innocent eyes. Abraham was skilled in sacrifice. Isaac crawls upon the altar. He presents his hands to his dad so he can tie them. Abraham is skilled in sacrifice. He'd offer many lambs. He puts his hand upon his son's chest, fills the rib cage, feels for the heart, because he wants to put the dagger right through the heart so that his son would die instantaneously rather than suffer. Who can understand Abraham's anguish at this moment? Abraham's God is satisfied by the disposition of the Father, by the disposition of the Son, which is forged now by fire. And without haste, God sends his angel to stay the hand of Abraham. The angel says, Lay not a hand upon the boy, neither do thou anything to him. Now I know that thou fearest God, and hath not spared thine only begotten Son for my sake. The words of God. I speak to all the boys here today. This is really a sermon for boys. Your fathers love you the same as Abraham loved Isaac. We should look at Abraham and Isaac when we are asked to do something difficult. This dutiful son was willing to sacrifice his own life simply because it was God's command. This is the obedience that we owe to our parents, to our teachers. To our priest. Dear parents, God may require such a sacrifice from you. He may take your children in death or in a religious vocation. Be generous and seek only the salvation of your children. Abraham, we are told, carefully concealed this divine command from his wife Sarah. He feared Sarah in her mother's heart would try to save her son, try to prevent the sacrifice. We call those firemen who rush into fire heroes. We call those policemen who dodge bullets heroes. Heroic is too weak of a word to describe Abraham. Abraham's character to suffer and to suffer this cross alone from heaven as our Lord did when he would have loved to have the compassion of his apostles on Holy Thursday night. In Abraham, we see the father and the sacrificing priest. Here in this story, God demonstrates perfect obedience for the whole world to see. The command given by God was enough to stagger a normal person's mind was enough to undermine Abraham's faith. 
But Abraham, steeled in virtue, descends Mount Moriah with his faith stronger. Thus in Isaac we behold the Redeemer, both the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. With faith and hope like Abraham, let our wills be submissive to the will of God in all things. Some are surprised at such a command from the God of the Jews. But let us remember, those pagans have no right to claim the lives of those who follow them, those pagan gods which are non-existent. Our God does have the right to claim our life. He is the arbiter of life. He gave us life at a certain time in history, and he will take our life at a certain time in history as we have been tested. No religion has ever existed without sacrifice. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, sacrifice has always been required. In anxious obedience to the command of the angel, Abraham unties his son Isaac and turning around saw a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. He took therefore the ram so providentially sent him by God and offered it for a holocaust instead of his son. Isaac is a remarkable figure of our divine Savior. From his birth, passion, death, and his resurrection, like Christ, Isaac was born of divine promise. Like Mary and Joseph, Abraham and Sarah were most worthy parents. Christ died upon Mount Calvary. Isaac dies upon Mount Moriah, morally speaking. Isaac carried upon his shoulders the wood of sacrifice as our Lord carried the cross upon his shoulders. A sword, the soldier's sword, pierced our Lord's side as the knife was about to pierce Isaac's side to his heart. As Christ's father offered his son, so Isaac's father offered to God his son. Morally, in the sight of God, when Isaac consented to the death of sacrifice, he merited martyrdom. And he arose like Christ, full of life, from the altar as Christ did from the grave, from Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. The ram, once again, crowned by a thorny thicket. Just before it is to be sacrificed, the ram's head is surrounded by thorns, as was Christ head surrounded by the crown of thorns. Abraham bound the ram and laid it upon the wood of the altar as Christ was bound and placed upon the wood of the cross. The crown is what we're thinking about today. It had such a ubiquitous presence in the life of the Jews. We see it from the crown over the tabernacle. We see it upon the altar of sacrifice. We see it upon the pillars in Solomon's temple. We see it graven into the ceiling. We see the crown upon the vestments worn by the Jewish priest of the Old Testament. All these, my dear friends, point to the crown received by our Lord the day he was to die. As the memory of the crown was beneficial, reminding the Jewish people of their selection by God, so to the memory of, contemplation of, and devotion to the crown of our Savior is beneficial to us Roman Catholics. God love you and God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.